Yeah. Welcome back to Job Math, the podcast for only the most fabulous Gen Z professionals. I'm Dale. And I'm Lisa. This podcast is for you if you want to unleash your potential and get the career that you want. Don't forget to follow and subscribe on Spotify. On YouTube. On the TikToks. And on Instagram. And download, for the love of God, download the Career Badger app. Um, we thought subliminal advertising was going to work, <laughs> but it feels like we've got to be a bit more explicit. Uh, we'd love you to download the app, come and chat with Lisa, but we'll uh, carry on. Today, Lisa, what are we going to talk about on our podcast? Today, we are lifting the, career, the lid on careers in design, branding, and all things creative. Wow. And so we must have an amazing guest lined up. Who are we talking to today? We do have an amazing guest today a brand strategy and design consultant who has served as an art director and advisor to many successful startups and challenger brands. Someone who, as we like to say, has been there, seen it, and done it all. So let's have our distinguished guest, Adam, please introduce yourself. No, I, I don't want to. I want you to keep on <laughs> introducing me. That was fantastic. I'm going to like, I'm going to bring you into every single client meeting I have just to kind of like hype me up. That was, that was spectacular. Thanks for having me, gang. This is great. Yeah. We are the, the career hype people for you. I'll take it. So Adam, uh, maybe give us a summary of your background. Tell us where you grew up. What did you study? What are some of the key jobs you've had and where do you find yourself today? You know, it, well, so that's a good question uh, because I took a really non-linear path to where uh, a lot of people want to end up. So I, I own a, a brand strategy and design consultancy. Um, it is a company of one. Uh, but prior to that, uh, you know, if you want to start back at the beginning, you know, when I went to, to university, it was at Center College. It's a small private liberal arts college based in Danville, Kentucky, USA. And uh, I majored in anthropology and theater. Uh, and the, the thing is, is like, I was really prepared for a career uh, on a game show called Jeopardy. And that did not pan out. And so I somehow found my way into brand strategy and design. And it, interestingly enough, like there, there are, there's enough connective tissue between where I started uh, with my education and where I wound up professionally. You know, when we're talking about uh, anthropology, we're talking about the study of other people, other cultures, how they think and feel and react. So like, how do people actually engage with the world around them? And the world around them includes brands, obviously. And theater, uh, this, is, this is the message that you're conveying. How do we present that information to these groups? So being able to, to kind of straddle that line between communicating to and understanding how it's being received, it works, it works really well. Um, unfortunately, though, because I didn't have like a really huge design background based out of my uh, experience, experience at Center, I ended up working at the college for a while. It was like a live testing ground. So I worked in the communications office there for a, a hot minute and then transferred over and became the assistant director of communications for admissions, which is a mouthful because no one knew what the hell I actually did, uh, which was, you know, I was, I was the visual coordinator for all things admissions. So uh, prospective students, they, they saw what I put out in front of them to represent the college. Uh, from there, I got picked up by uh, the 16th oldest college in the country, the first one founded west of the Allegheny Mountains, uh, Transylvania University. Um, and I re uh, led the uh, rebrand of that university over there before I realized I've spent 10 years in higher ed. And if I don't get the hell out of higher ed, I'm going to be stuck here forever. Jumped ship into the agency side of things, worked as an art director at a uh, brand studio called Shatterbox, and uh, found out after about two years of that and a prehistory uh, through higher ed that um, I don't work really well with people above me. Uh, I like to be in control. And that is the segue to... Mero, which is my brand strategy and design consultancy. So Mero has been around for five years. Um, it's positioned as working uh, with startups and challenger brands. At least that's where I do most of my lead gen. Ironically, though, uh, I still work with Center College. So right after I got done working at Transy, I jumped shit back home. And uh, now I still work with them on some of their prospective student and uh, admitted student materials. That was a long-winded intro. No one's going to want to listen to this. <laughs> 
it'll 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 um edit down into beautiful clips i promise like i love the, that uh, great thanks yeah, i was fingers. gonna say they're gonna follow it like a story they're like oh what's next you, you had us on the edge of our seats oh perfect good just tell us which of those responses you want to keep in and we'll edit, edit out the other <laughs> one. And so tell us about some of the different for, for people at the beginning of their career. Tell us about some of the different types of design roles there are and what people might like about some. You talked about working agency side, um, maybe versus client side. Maybe talk about the different types of design roles, the different organizations you might find yourself working in. them. You know, I think it's a really good idea to think about where you want to end up before you begin. Um, I am perfectly happy with where I am, but I do realize that because I started in-house in a small town at a small college, I mean, prestigious college, don't get me wrong, but a small college, the way I started out has set the trajectory for the rest of my career, right? Um, had I been prepared uh, and had I known where I was going to begin with, I probably would have started at a much larger uh, advertising agency, uh, if not a design studio, right? I would, have, I would have gotten the hell out of Dodge, right? I would have gone to New York. I would have gone to LA, Atlanta, Chicago, literally any, any city with a population that could support the kind of career that you know, I, I think maybe I, I aspired to when I was younger, but didn't really know what it was or how to get there. Again, I didn't take design classes in college. The only reason I know how to design uh, is because when I was producing shows in my theater program, there wasn't a marketing department on campus. We had a, a studio art department and we had an art history department, and neither of those knew how to put together uh, publicity or really basically propaganda in order to get butts in seats for these shows. So I did it. And that's how I figured out that I was actually a little bit better at design than I was directing. I was great at directing. Everyone said so. <laughs> so I think that was at least, you know, a good nudge in the right direction, but I didn't have things figured out. And so I, I don't want to say that my career has just happened to me. Um, as I've gotten older, I've kind of taken hold of it. But um, I guess the first piece of advice is figure out where you want to go and then backtrack from there to the beginning because where you start is going to have a pretty significant effect on where you end. Oh, that's great, Adam. Um, I think you've kiboshed our next question, which is about advising people at the start of their career. Um, unless there's anything more you want to add to that? So when we're looking at the types of roles that you might step into fresh out the gate, whether you've, you know, invested in a design education or, you know, you've gone to YouTube University, uh, the roles are going to vary based on what track you want to put yourself into, right? If you go to a design studio or an agency, you're going to find yourself in a lot of production-based roles, and that's fine. Because there are so many creative people in those offices, it's going to niche you down into a specific role. Um, and that's perfectly fine, right? Like, especially at those lower level roles, that's where you kind of, you know, get a feel for uh, how the office structure works, what the relationships are like, both professionally and personally. Um, but if you go in house, right, this is the, uh, the other side of that coin, you tend to find that the roles that you're offered are very generalist. This was my trajectory. So I had my fingers in a little bit of everything. I was doing video. I was doing web design. I was doing print. I was doing social media, all of that stuff. And, and I'll be honest with you. I do think small businesses ask a little too much of their designers. They basically take everything they know about visual communication and shove it into one role and say, this would be great for someone just starting out. Technically, it's a terrible idea, but... It's a good place for you, the uh, uh, freshly employed, to kind of weave yourself around and figure out what you actually enjoy doing. So there are pros and cons to, to either track when you start out. Cool. Um, and then maybe talk through um, going from being employed to then becoming freelance or having you know, your, your own business. Um, how was that for you? And, and what wisdom have you gleaned from that about people that might want to follow in those footsteps? So I worked uh, as an art director at a brand studio. It was also a small studio. It was less than 10 people in it. Um, and it was, it was towards the end of that where I started recognizing that in order for me to be fulfilled and happy, I, didn't, I did not want to sell my time to another person, right? And this was kind of the impetus for why I wanted to start my own thing because we were charging by the hour. 
it was 125 US dollars uh, to, to work on any project. And we would have to estimate how long it would take for us to complete a project. This is not uncommon in the design or, or creative spaces. It's pretty much the norm. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not awful. I, I stand by the, uh, uh, the truism that um, timesheets, they are lies. The number of times I lied on timesheets far <laughs> outweighed the number of times I ever told the truth. And that was for two reasons. One, I wanted to look productive. Two, uh, when you tell a client that it's going to come in between 40 and 60 hours and you just spent the last 40 hours trying to figure out what you were going to do, that leaves 20 to execute just to get at the top end. And it penalizes the client, right? So what ends up happening is you, you end up uh, making the client upset because you are taking too long, uh, or you get upset because you're able to complete the work so quickly, right? So this is, this is the fundamental problem with, with time-based uh, pricing. You have competing interests. The client wants you to work fast and cheap, and you want to take as long as possible and stretch out that time such that you can get paid for all the creative energy that you've expended on their project. So once you realize that, working for someone else, just it's it's kind of gut-wrenching. And so I figured, okay, well, I'm not going to convince this studio to, to price my, my time and creative output out the way I want it. So I, I'll just create my own studio, which is a great idea, except for the fact that it requires a whole other skill set that I was woefully unprepared uh, to, to take on, right? Being an entrepreneur is very different than showing up and sitting down at a computer and knocking out some cool design work. The only way you get to do that is if you do it on Fiverr, which is another way to say you will starve. Um, it's not a way to make Make your living. So it took me a little bit to get my bearings underneath me to figure out how to actually uh, find people who knew how to do taxes that I could trust. That's important. All the licenses required to get the business up and running, uh, to not run afoul of the law. That's difficult. And then the hardest part, I didn't have a steady stream of new business walking in the door. I had a few clients that I'd kind of, you know, nurtured over the previous years, but I was more or less starting from scratch. Here's the biggest piece of advice I can give you when you start a new business. Figure out who the hell your audience is really, really early. Because if you are everything to everyone, then you are pretty much nothing to anyone. And that's a, everyone knows this instinctually, but it's hard to think about when you are desperate for work and you just want to take anything. Um, so I niched down to start working on startups and challenger brands. Now, this is, this is a cheat. Uh, one of my, um, one of my favorite people in the world, great author, his name is Blair Inns. He's uh, written the uh, Win Without Pitching Manifesto and Pricing Creativity. Um, he would tell me that I have absolutely adulterated his advice here. And he's, he's kind of right. Um, when, when we position, we're supposed to go way down so that a very narrow set of people know exactly what we do and we can claim expertise in that vertical, right? Um, startups, very wide to start with, right? Because now we're not basing our positioning on uh, the type of business, but we're basing it instead on uh, the stage of the business. Also, startups, they don't have a lot of money, at least uh, a lot of those pre-seed uh, uh, startups and even some seed funded startups. This is like that first uh, round of money that startups will get. Like unless you're working with a company that's you know, received their series A to the tune of a few million dollars, you're not gonna get paid a, an awful lot. So I have challenger brands on the side as a way to uh, kind of pad the bank account. And challenger brands, this is a term coined by Adam Morgan. Um, and, you know, challenger brands, they tend to fall into, they, well, they have three des descriptors that they typically fall into. Uh, one, they are uh, just just starting out and they're experiencing a high rate of growth. Um, they are willing to try unconventional uh, tactics in order to get where they're going. And they need a lot of impact for a lot less money than it would typically take. So all of those things kind of converge together. And it basically describes a startup, but you still have more established brands that want to take on that, um, that kind of feel as well. So through those two niches, if they're even niches at all, and some of my previous relationships, I've been able to kind of sustain the business in a really productive way. I've not skipped a paycheck yet, and I've eaten every single one of my meals. And I think that's a success story. That's great. That's what we all aspire to, right? Especially as we venture out on our own. So great tips there. Now, I'm very curious your take on this next topic, which is AI, something that lots of people are talking about, certainly has some impacts in 
design as well. So have you seen AI already making an impact to your work or the industry, or where do you see that going? Oh, I've got lots to talk about on this. Um, I will I will not bury the lead. Uh, I think AI is fine and it might be great. Um, if we want to expand out further, you know, there are some ethical concerns about the the, the training uh, data that is fed into it so that it can generate these images that are really kind of based on other people's work. But I've, I've got some news for everybody. That's that's how the entire course of human history has worked. We are always standing on the shoulders of other people who figured shit out before us, right? The thing that's different this time is that AI can do it much faster. And this is the kind of like when we're talking about pricing time, this is where it gets really really, really dirty because now AI can do it much faster. And if we're thinking about time as being, being fungible, well, you know, I, I'm going to want the work done just as fast as possible. It doesn't matter what it looks like. So it does kind of put a priority there. So I'll say all the negative stuff up first. That's that. Um, but I think it can be really, really beneficial. It, what we'll need to do is get really clear on um, how content is created, right? Right now, the stuff that AI is kicking out it's impressive, but it is not to a fidelity that I would feel comfortable like typing a prompt in and delivering the output uh, completely untouched to a client for a couple of reasons. One, the client technically doesn't own that image. It is not copyrightable at present. So that's one reason. But also, it's it's got a little bit of that uncanny valley uh, uh, glisten on it. It doesn't feel quite right. Great though for productivity, right? If I want to concept something uh, and not go through the, the process of hiring a, uh, a 3D modeler, I can get it done to enough fidelity that the client can sign on and then give me the money to go hire the person that can actually do it to fidelity. So in terms of, of that stuff, and then also research, right? I do a lot of brand strategy research. It's nice just to have a thought partner. I use uh, Claude.ai for that. I use uh, ChatGPT4 for that. So uh, most of my use in AI is actually in the strategy and writing work. Very rarely does the uh, uh, the large language model ever kick out something that I can just copy and paste and say, oh, yes, that's exactly the right answer. But the process of going through the conversation typically yields something fruitful in my own head that I can then develop uh, after that. It's hard when you work by yourself. If you can trick yourself in, into thinking that you're talking to a sentient being on the other side of the computer, that self-delusion is great because now it feels like you've got a partner or a team. Um, Transitioning off of that, uh, let me talk about the agency side of things or the, or the industry. Um, so we, I, I work in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, it's the second largest city in Kentucky behind Louisville. But Louisville doesn't even really think it's a Kentucky city. Uh, they got a little bit of snobbery about them, which is not entirely unwarranted. It's a great city. Uh, but I would argue that Lexington is probably better by virtue of, you know, having my feet planted here. Um, but we, we got the American Advertising Federation. This is the largest advertising federation in America. It's made up of uh, several districts, I believe nine, which uh, each district contains a, a series of local clubs spread throughout a few states. So we've got AAF Lexington. And we just held the American Advertising Awards here in Lexington, which I got to host uh, again for the second year, this time in sequence. It was great. You missed a terrific show um, and an open bar. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the uh, agency that won Best of Show, the agency is called Coomer, and it won for a campaign they uh, called Kentucky After Dark. And what they did, here are the bare bones, they went to different cities around Kentucky with a Kentucky tourism board, I believe. And they looked up the local lore and legends and created like iconic horror posters and scenes featuring like the monsters and ghouls, villains and ghosts that, you know, those cities had in their in their folklore traditions and then they used ai to create those visual images then they had uh as i, be I believe i'm not 100 percent on this they did do some retouching and um i understand so i was not there for the judging but what i understand the judges discussed because it was a bit contentious do we want to give uh, a piece of work that relied so heavily on ai uh the best of show they won best of show the biggest award possible. They cleaned up. And the conversation, as I understand it, was, uh, you know, AI is coming. We've seen a lot of bad AI. But in order to keep this amount of consistency from image to image to image, because they had at, at least a couple dozen, I want to say, different images for this campaign, to keep it all consistent across video and, and uh, uh, imagery and copy, 
it was a pretty adept use at AI or use of AI at this early stage. Um, maybe we'll see more of that. But the thing I think to keep in mind is that that was human augmented AI work. And this is Greg Shove uh, from Section. Um, he talks about this, and I'm going to butcher his language, but I'll get the concepts pretty much right. We're going to need to start thinking about putting labels on the type of content that uh, uh, is going online. You're going to have human-created content. You'll have AI-augmented content, and then you'll have AI-created content. And it'll be important for us to slap those labels on there. I mean, if, I don't know if you've seen what Sora is doing uh, uh, here recently. This is um, uh, the, the new video uh, AI uh, creator. It's, it's remarkable. Still uncanny, but we're very early into this. The internet is just, if it's not already a giant lie factory, it, it's going to become one so soon that it will be an unreliable mess of bullshit. So um, those labels will be important. That's great. I, it sounds like you are aware and realistic about where it is right now and that at least your impact on the industry can be that too, right? Let's use it for what it can do, but let's also remember the human element. So I sounds also, if someone's wanting a career in this, they need to prepare for a lot of changes to come in terms of what they know and how they utilize different technologies, for sure. Absolutely. Um, so I, I work right next door to uh, an agency here in Lexington called Cornette. Um, they've won Ad Age's Best Small Agency of the Year a couple years now. Um, I mean, really a fantastically creative crew. They, uh, they did professional development with some of their uh, designers and art directors to get them trained up on AI so they would know how to go through prompting correctly to create uh, uh, different um, uh, uh, prototypes for their clients. And they're currently in the process of writing their AI policy, which is exactly what they should be doing, you know, getting ahead of it before the snowball gets too big to control. That's great. It's bringing in a lot of different elements, I would say, from your intro of your winding path to starting your career to where you are today. I think it shows that we just learn new things as they come. And it sounds like you, you've done that and you see the industry doing that too. 100%. 100%. Change or die. Right. So, Adam, now we often ask people um, their sort of do's and don'ts for, for job seeking or job applications, whether that's in their resume, the portfolio or in their interview process. But maybe in your case, we'll flip this, like in terms of you talked about getting those first few customers and, and find that niche. Like what are the tips you'd give to someone that's just trying to reach out to their first clients or, or trying to write those pitches, maybe would be a great angle for you without giving away too many of your amazing <laughs> sure. trade secrets. Um, you know, gosh, some of this stuff can't be taught. And that's, that's the hard part. I, I do think that you need to be prepared to be resilient because you are undoubtedly going to screw it up more times than not when you're first starting out. Um, you get better because you start to figure out what works. Um, but, you know, this is going to sound a little cliche, but you've got to have confidence. I think clients can sniff out someone who's not entirely sure if they know what they're doing. And that kind of uncertainty does nothing but drive a client away. It smells so bad. Uh, one of the ways that you can get better at being confident is knowing your worth and then setting your prices a little bit higher than that. Um, if you, cause I mean, again, like we, we can't always, I'm never going to be able to, to look at a design agency and know whether or not I'm going to have a perfect working relationship with them that uh, I value a hundred percent, no problems. Right. So I'm going to use heuristics to kind of figure it out. So I'll look at who they've worked with in the past. Are these the type of clients that I would associate myself with? I might look at, um, uh, the quality of work that they do, that's helpful, but that doesn't really say anything about the relationships. I'll also look at how much and how they charge. Price is a really good heuristic to figure out whether or not something is valuable. Rory Sutherland, uh, who is the vice chairman at Ogilvy, any opportunity I have to mention this man's name, I do. I have uh, a little bit of a platonic crush on him. He is probably the most well-spoken, intelligent human being I've ever encountered. Uh, Rory, hit me up. I'll give you my phone number. We'll go out for dinner. Um, my treat. Uh, but he, he has this story uh, uh, about, you know, if, if something isn't selling, 
before you start thinking about decreasing the price, consider raising it. I believe he, he tells the story about a, uh, a silversmith um, that was selling rings at like $100 a pop or something, and uh, they weren't selling very well. And so the, uh, uh, the shop attendant was told to decrease the price, but somehow an extra zero was added rather than taken away. And suddenly these things are selling like crazy. It's the same damn ring, but because it's priced so high, it's an instinctive heuristic cue to the person walking by, oh, this must be valuable. There are there are limits to this, right? Like it's probably not a good idea to to pop right out of your design education and say, okay, it's going to be fifty thousand dollars bare minimum to work with me. Um, that will turn a lot of people off. But finding that balance, and this is where you'll fail sometimes. Finding that balance will be really important. Yeah, I, Great. I'm a fe Thanks. fellow uh, business crush on uh, on Rory, so we'll, we'll try and find some links. So this is great. Some... Yeah, an intellectual menage a trois. Let's do it, Dale. <laughs> yeah, so so Rory, if you if you're watching, you know where to find us. <laughs> Make it happen. Oh. Um, he's. I listened to one of his recent uh, postings, and it was talking about uh, the psychology of toilet paper. But when... <laughs> Do you have a bidet? Have you taken his advice? He loves Japanese toilets. He's all over the Japanese toilets. So, yeah. um, so I think there's you know if we all followed him, there's going to be a trend on bidets and Japanese toilets. Um, uh, Dale, I I literally just installed a bidet in my studio about a month ago, and the hype is real. Uh, well, so I'm living in Spain now, and so the bidet is is a much more common phenomenon here. Yeah. Um, uh, if you go to the Middle East, I mean, I'm sure people are here for the B-Day and ass wiping, you know, content. Um, <laughs> we're, but we're, look, we're, I'm, I have, I have, we're making uh, you live your best life. Yeah. That's what we're trying exactly. to do, right? This is not the first time I've been accused of being full of shit. So I, I come with that honorific. <laughs> yeah. So in, and in the Middle East, you get like a, a like a squirty tap. It's all like very... So yeah, yeah. There's, there's there's a few solutions to different human problems out there. I 100%. think is, is, is learning. We are not um, just solving career problems; we are solving life problems here today. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so rough transition from toilets to my next question, but um, a lot about failing at the beginning. So I'm curious if you have any job fails that you would like to share with us of how you survived them. Yeah, um, I, I don't think it'll come as a surprise to, to anyone having listened this far. Um, I, I tend to run my mouth an awful lot. Um, and one of the mistakes I made several times before I was finally sat down uh, by one of my clients, uh, I would write things down in email, right? And I was doing it with a, uh, I was trying to do it generously, right? But if I see something, so in this particular case, I had a client who I had just delivered uh, a brand design package to, and they had taken all of the assets and had clearly not read the style guide. We're talking about, you know, taking symbols included in logos, breaking them apart from their word marks and retyping the name of the, uh, uh, the business right there. And then these were being hung uh, on banners throughout their, their building. It was just... It was a nightmare. And I'm seeing pictures of this rolling and they are so excited. They're like, look at this new brand. And I'm like, that's not the way it's supposed to look. That's not what we designed. Where's, where's your adherence to the style guide? And so I wrote them a very direct email stressing the importance of getting this part right because you only have one opportunity to roll out a brand for the first time, right? You are building these foundational mental and visual associations and you have already started to bungle this and you need to tighten it up very quickly. Um, don't send that in an email. That's a terrible idea. Client literally sent me an email and said, we'd like to schedule a meeting. I had to drive 45 minutes outside of the city to sit down in an office where I was essentially scolded for not having a proper tone. And frankly, the client was right. Like it was just when, when you need to communicate something of importance, do not put it in an email, right? I've gone back and read that email dozens of times. I know what I was intending, but I also know how it was received. Pick up the damn phone and talk to someone face to face because you lose so much in written communication. Tone is super important, even if you're being factual. 
I think that's a perfect advice. Thanks for sharing that story, especially as we've just been talking about technology. There is still a place for human right conversation and connection. And I think that's really important for um, all of us to remember, but especially people starting off their career, right, where they might not have that solid brand behind them or they're still building up their credentials. So we still have sure. to have conversations. Yeah. And it's hard. I mean, and, and look, I don't, I don't like to stereotype generations. I think, I think thinking about generations as, you know, comprehensive uh, groups that all feel and think the same way is probably not the right way to go about it. Obviously there are generational differences. Um, so I will just say this, rather than pinning this on Gen Z exclusively, uh, I'll look at it from just folks starting out in their, their careers. Um, it is, it is not unusual to feel like you are faking it or that you don't have the authority or the permission to talk to people who are above you. But when you, when you put that on yourself, it, it forfeits your opportunity to grow with leadership. The more that you are interacting with leadership in a hierarchical office situation, the better your chances are for getting promoted because we tend to favor people that we know more than people who just look good on paper. Right. And so those relationships are really crucial to build. And you just, you've just got to do it. It's going to be a little uncomfortable, but you'll get better with it each time you do it. So make those attempts at any point you have. Thanks, Adam. That's fantastic advice. Uh, and yeah, I think it's probably an overlooked thing. I think people often think about the, the hard skills, you know, like I can use this technology or I can do this type of design or I can do this type of um, discipline, whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, those relationships are uh, really cool. Uh, crucial. Um, switching gears a little bit now, how are you balancing work and other things in your life right now? Oh, I've recently taken to telling people um, that I have found a third end of the candle to burn. And I think it's like right in the middle. So now I've really uh, kind of messed myself up here. So I look, one of the reasons that I started my career uh, in Danville um, and not in a major city was because that's, that's where my wife was. And we knew that we were going to have a family together. And that was where my priority was at that moment. And it still is right. But like, I can feel when you, when you become an entrepreneur, that starts to shift a little bit, right? Like we only have so much time that we can invest into the things that we want to do. And so my, my children aren't infants anymore. I've got 12 year old twins. Um, so they're self-sufficient, a little latchkey, if you will. Uh, but now I've got this business to take care of and make sure that, you know, it doesn't run into insolvency. That's a, that would be a major problem, but I've, I've recently, because, because there's no other, there's no other way to, to, to not do it. Like I've gotten to a point in my life where I've become really focused on, uh, time and the amount of it that I have left. And so, uh, I have an art, a lifelong uh, work of art that I've been uh, building for the last two years now. Um, it's called Sold, and uh, it requires a great deal of effort and time. And that's that third end of the candle. Uh, last night, uh, I had a studio show here in, in, in this studio that I'm standing in right now. It was called Lanyap. About 50 people uh, came through to see some of the old works, some of the new works, and experience a time machine. I built a time machine. Um, it was a great show. I missed my daughter's orchestra concert. And uh, of course, this is something that she's been working on with, with her classmates for the last few months. Um, and she was even at the last minute given a speech to read, introducing uh, the pieces that they would be talking about. And I wasn't there. And frankly, that sucks really, really bad. Uh, I don't love that. I don't know any other way around it because these these priorities that start to come together they will inevitably conflict i will tell you this i check in with my wife very frequently and i'm like hey are we still good do i have any blind spots am i putting pressure on the family that i'm not aware of right um I talk to my kids frequently not as candidly as i do my wife but i want to make sure that you know I know I'm not giving 100% to my family, but I want to make sure that the time that I am allocating to them and my business and this art project, it, all three wheels have to keep spinning. Some can slow down from time to time, but I have to check in with others because I can't see, I can't see my blind spots on this one. I think that's great advice for people to think about 
also I think you bring up really important that our priorities change over the course of time and we have to be aware enough to realize maybe the thing that was most important when I started my career has changed a little bit, right? And we have opportunity costs, but we just have to be willing to acknowledge when things change or when we want to try something different. And certainly I think it's great advice from that entrepreneur perspective is be real about what you're jumping into, right? If you want to do this and you feel ready, just go in with your eyes open. I think that makes for a better experience. And, and get, and get the, I don't want to call it permission, but I mean, that's kind of what it is, right? Like I, I'm not the only entrepreneur in my family. So is my wife. We have a joint checking account. Like every every asset that we have is intertwined. So in a very real sense, I, my family, are, they are on this entrepreneurial journey with me. They can't jump off the ship. We are in the middle of the ocean together and I've just got to make sure the thing keeps on floating. So I feel our whole conversation has had a lot of advice that you've already shared. Um, but as you reflect back, would you share either the best and or worst uh, career advice that you have ever received? Okay. Uh, I'm going to answer this a little bit sideways. Um, I'm going to share a piece of advice that I didn't take seriously, but it probably was the truest thing I've ever been told. Now, up until this point, as far as you know, I founded Marrow by myself. I got I got a fire lit up inside my belly and went out and took on the world. That's not entirely true. Uh, there were two additional partners when uh, I originally founded Marrow. We split the company uh, right down the, the the middles, so it was, it was one third ownership <laughs> across the board. And um, my father in law told me he said, "Listen." When you do this, you need to be aware that you are effectively marrying these two men because you are entering into legally binding contracts with them. So as far as you are concerned, right, this is, this is a very real relationship, second probably only to the one that you have with your wife, who happened to be his daughter. So of course, he wanted me to make sure I was making good decisions. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. I got this. Thanks. And um, fast forward 11 months. And sure enough, I'm divorcing my fucking partners. Uh, we never really got in alignment on what Marrow was supposed to be because we all thought, I think that, I, I think we all thought that we could change the other two and that didn't happen. Uh, so if you do decide to go into business for yourself where you are sharing partnership responsibilities, um, it, it it very much is like like marrying them. I was sick for weeks after that partnership dissolved. I thought my reputation and credibility were going to get flushed straight down the toilet. They didn't. I was fine, but I didn't eat very well. I lost weight. I was a ball of stress. Um, but bear that in mind, because that took a toll on me for a few weeks after after the announcement came out. Um, the worst advice I have ever received is take whatever you can get. And that's terrible advice because that will lead you down a path to mediocrity. There's a race to the bottom. If you aren't saying no to some opportunities, you are effectively wasting your time, right? It's good to try things out. It's good to put yourself out there. You want to try and get lucky. You want opportunities. But at some point, you have got to shut some of these first doors such that you can begin going through one set of hallways and then hopefully down another set because you're never going to get deeper in your career if you're constantly jumping from thing to thing to thing, be it you know a trade or a client or what have you. That's great. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thanks, Adam. And um, yeah, really appreciate some of the candor and those, you know, quite personal moments you're sharing. Um, I think is adding, um, yeah, a lot of color and a lot of impact on the advice that the people will get from it. Um, you've mentioned some books, you've mentioned some influencers on various mediums, uh, including yourself. Um, do you have uh, book and or podcast recommendations or any whatever medium you want of um, content um, that you'd recommend people starting out on their design or brand careers? Yeah, you know, um, let's just get the elephant in the room right out of the way. Uh, the, the book that I recommend to literally anyone who will listen to me for 15 seconds, it's Roy Sutherland's Alchemy. Um, it is 
it is so good. Uh, it's great for folks that are focused on brand and design, but really it's just a, it's a great manual to kind of start thinking about how you perceive the, the world around you. It's absolutely exquisite. As far as podcasts are concerned, I used to listen to a lot of industry podcasts and I just don't anymore because like, that's enough. I, I am already <laughs> in the industry. I, there, like, there's, I think there's like the marketing book podcast, and sometimes that's fun, and, and that's fine. And and I, I would not tell anyone to not listen to those podcasts. I am at a point now, though, where like I, I can't be so one dimensional. I've got to listen to something else, and so I will put in a recommendation for two podcasts that I particularly like that are outside, just outside branding and design. Uh, one is Hidden Brain, and the other is Freakonomics. Both of these podcasts do a really good job of exploring topics that take you just outside of uh, your your you know perceived world and give you a new perspective on you know sometimes small things, sometimes large things. But you've got to add some texture to the content that you're putting into your brain. The the interconnectedness of ideas is super important when we're talking about branding and design. You don't want to stall out, and it's really easy to do that because most of the content that I see online these days is here are the trends to look forward to in 2024 what's coming up in 2025 and it's just like okay like if i want to know that i probably want to know it to avoid it but it's easy to get stuck on that as a way to become relevant the better idea is to find points of differentiation and you're only ever going to be able to do that by i think diversifying the things that you feed to your brain I'm so glad it's someone other than me recommending those podcasts. Those are two I recommend to everyone. So now I'm validated in my love of them. A hundred percent. Yeah, no, they're great. Yeah, me too. On the freak, I, I think I must have read Freakonomics maybe 15, uh, possibly even longer ago. Uh, but yeah, the sort of like <laughs> moment, the sort of mind blown moment. Um, a great way examples. to think differently about things for sure, right? Like, oh, I've thought of this topic before, but never that way. Yeah. And exactly. Think, and that's, I think that's, that and that's what branding is, right? Like you're, whenever we're talking about branding, we are again, trying to figure out points of differentiation. If, if you are leaning too far into being relevant to an audience, you will inevitably become a commodity. A brand is about figuring out what is so distinctive and different about you that it will stick in the minds of people when they encounter whatever it is that you're trying to sell them, be it a product or an idea or a service. Yeah, so if you like uh, Freakonomics, there's also people I mostly admire, I think is by the same host. So Is it? Uh, oh, I think you're right. Is it Stephen Dubner? For some reason, I've got that as Stephen Melody Gladwell. Stephen Levitt. It's, the, there we go. it's one of the Steves, isn't it? Because they're both both the guys who, who wrote the book. are both called Steve, confusingly. Yes. Um, so, great. Um, Lisa. As we think. wrap up, Adam... Um, Anything you want to pitch us on, anything you want to share about your business, use our platform to also help you out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mentioned earlier, um, I've got this uh, lifelong time-based work of art called Sold. And, and now you've heard me say it twice already. Um, it's not spelled the way you likely think it's intended to be spelled. It's S-O-U-L-E-D. Um, and in short, basically what I'm doing is I'm creating 12 identical prints at a time, uh, and they double in value as they sell, all right? But they're only available for 12 days, and any work from, from those editions that don't sell, uh, they're destroyed in the performance of Awake, which is exactly what we did in the, uh, in the studio here last night. We actually had to go outside because there's fire involved, and I didn't want to burn the entire building down. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a big project and you can find that at, uh, the web-based installation. It's, uh, www dot, right. Sold S O U L E D dot art. Um, Marrow is doing really, really well. And I owe a lot of sold success to many of the things I learned while running this business. I don't think that project could exist without everything I figured out here. Um, but that is, that is that's what keeps me up at night now. I've gotten really good at managing clients and I can run those on autopilot. Art is very different. It's an entire world completely untethered from objective reality, uh, which is a fun space to play in. Thanks, Great. Adam. We'll make That's sure nice. to link that for everybody, right? Check it yeah, out we after. Will get, we will get the links of all, all the things will be in the comments. Um, Adam, so much thanks. Um, I knew you were going to be a fantastic guest. Um, when when we first 
uh, spoke and I because um, say I think Lisa and I are both going through our contact list and thinking <laughs> who's going to make a fantastic guest and I say I think you've more than delivered who knew we were going to get b-day stories um, <laughs> when talking about brand and and design consulting um, and yeah real pleasure having you on all right very good well I'll let you all get to it thank you all so much again and uh, look forward to talking again soon pleasure meeting yeah. you Lisa yeah you too all right, bye y'all. Okay. okay, Lisa, what are your reflections on Adam's sharings? Sharings? I'm not sure sharings? if that's a word. Yeah, uh, insights. He had so many great insights, I think, on figuring out what type of career you think you want, trying to move towards that. And I think just being real. He was very real about what worked, what didn't. Having to, to pivot, the joys and struggles of being an entrepreneur, I think he really covered all the things, thinking about industries, thinking about how I can take my strengths in a different direction. Um, so a lot of takeaways there for me. How about you? I mean, Adam's an amazing storyteller. And um, I th uh, we mentioned it uh, a little bit earlier, but the candor he, he gave, I thought was really great. I think it's easy to make generalizations about you might want to do this, but I think that this happened to me and this was personal with my family or my friends, that sort of stuff. Stories he's telling. Um, and, you know, besides anything, uh, if you look at Adam's work, got amazing um, life design and, and stories and that sort of stuff. Yes. So, yeah, uh, an amazing person to look up to and to aspire to be like. Yeah. All right. Shall Shall we, shall we uh, do another readout? Um, so, sure. uh, guys, we've, uh, if you're still listening, everyone, um, we said at the top of this podcast that subliminal messaging apparently does not work as well as we thought it might. Um, so, Lisa, read us out. Yeah. So, now you've made it to the end of the podcast, which we hope means you found it interesting, entertaining, and possibly even valuable. We know you found this one that way. So, if so, why not subscribe on all the things, Spotify, YouTube, Follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Even better, if you want to unleash your potential and get the career that you want, you can visit Career Badger uh, for a bunch of our free resources. Or even better than that, download our mobile app for iPhone and get real human coaching. It's not ChatGPT. It's the real thing from Drumroll, Lisa, our in-house coach. Uh, you can do live human uh, chat. Uh, coaching with Lisa, uh, whether you want help with your resume, got an interview to prepare for, trying to negotiate promotion at work, or just trying to figure out what the hell to do in my life, Lisa's going to have the answers for you. That's it from us. See you next time. Uh, 